Good morning, Christ Fellowship. Good morning. It is great to assemble together and worship our God and fellowship uh, together to make much of Christ today. Uh, if you are visiting with us for the first time, we're very glad that you are here. And uh, it would be uh, our privilege to get to know you a little bit better. So if you have a few minutes uh, after the service, uh, if you would stop by uh, right out front uh, here, we will have a guest greeter uh, who will be taking in uh, visitor information, and that will help us uh, during the week get to know you better and uh, give us an opportunity to reach out to you. Again, uh, she'll be stationed right outside the front entrance here. On Saturday, September 19th, the... Uh, coming this coming Saturday from 9 to 11 a.m., uh, we're going to be holding our next uh, membership class. Uh, in this class, uh, Peter is going to be walking uh, potential members uh, through our statement of faith, what we believe as a church, uh, and our church covenant, so how we uh, want to uh, live together uh, our, in our church life. Um, and again, that is going to be this Saturday, the 19th from 9 to 11. Now, it will be held outside, uh, weather permitting. Uh, if you have any questions about that, feel free to see me after the service, uh, and you can also RSVP to me uh, as well. Now, on Sunday, September 27th, we're going to be taking up our annual uh, offering for Vision Virginia, which is sort of the uh, annual missions offering of the Southern Baptist Conservatives of Virginia. Uh, 100% of this offering goes to uh, ministries across the Commonwealth, including statewide evangelism, church planting, disaster relief, food, food distribution, uh, seminarian scholarships, church revitalization, and much more. Now, this is a special offering, and it's distinct from our normal uh, Sunday morning offering. So uh, if you have uh, any questions about that, again, feel free to see me. Uh, and when giving to SBCV, we ask that you do earmark the check uh, Vision Virginia offering and that will help our treasurer uh, know how to designate that. Uh, and finally, on September 20th, Sunday, September 20th, from 5 to 7, uh, we're going to be relaunching our youth group. Uh, this is the first time we've had uh, our youth group since uh, the COVID situation, and we are going to be meeting outside. We'll keep it simple, we'll just have pizza, uh, a game or two, and a Bible lesson. Uh, all youth aged uh, 10 to 18 are encouraged to participate, and parents are uh, encouraged to come as well. If you have any questions about that, uh, feel free to see Peter after the service. Now at this time, let's take a moment to quiet our hearts uh, before the Lord and prepare uh, to seek his face and worship him. And in a moment, I'll be reading our call to worship uh, passage this morning, which is uh, Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10. Let's quiet our hearts. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning in Jesus' name, thanking you for the opportunity we have today to worship you in spirit and in truth. We acknowledge this morning that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that you are the creator God by whom all things on heaven and on earth were made that you are the Holy One of Israel, set apart and perfect in righteousness and purity, and that you are our gracious Savior, our Redeemer, our righteousness, our sanctification, our intercessor and advocate. O oh, Holy Father, as we sing songs of praise to you and listen to your word preached, remind us this day, more than anything else, that you are these things for us and so much more. Gracious God, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to dwell among us, encouraging us, convicting us, reproving us, sanctifying us in your truth. Your word is truth. By your Spirit, direct our eyes toward heaven, where Christ is, whose blood covers our sin in full. And Father, forgive us for our sins. And as we confess and forsake them before the throne of grace today, do as you promised in cleansing us from all unrighteousness. We praise you, O oh God, that you've re removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. So we have great confidence and boldness, great assurance because of Christ our Savior, who is willing to forgive and strong to save. Father, be with our brother Peter this morning as he proclaims your word. Fill him with your spirit and with great boldness. Teach us, O oh God, what it means to walk in wisdom, 
to make the best use of the time you've given us and to be filled with your spirit. Teach us the fear of the Lord that Solomon talks about here in the Proverbs. Uh, For indeed, such is the beginning of wisdom. Lord, be glorified now, we pray. May you be lifted up and exalted in our worship. We pray all these things for the sake of Christ our Lord and in his name. Amen. Good morning, Christ Fellowship Church of Williamsburg. It's so nice to say that this time and, and have people in the, in the congregation as opposed to when I had to do that when we were recording video. Today we are continuing in our uh, message or in Ephesians, and the topic is walking in wisdom. And the first verse is, so walk as the wise and not as fools. And so we're going to be singing about wisdom and where we get our wisdom. The first verse, or the first song is immortal, invisible, God only wise. And then how great is our God and following up with he leadeth me. He gives us everything we need for our path. So stand and let's sing those songs of wisdom, um, proclaiming where we get our wisdom and uh, thanking God for, for leading us. of our God who gives us wisdom. How great is our God. Sing with me there. The splendor of the King clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice trembles at his voice how great
Well, that last hymn is um, a beautiful hymn. I grew up singing that. I think some of you also grew up singing that, and it's such a good reminder that our God is faithful and kind, a God who leads us day by day, year by year, and always leads us faithfully home to be with him forever. And so we, we rejoice in that this morning. Let's go to this God in prayer. Let's worship him together this morning through prayer. Lord God, we praise you for the truth that we just sang of your faithfulness to lead us. Now, Lord, we are like sheep and so easy for us to go astray, and we are often afraid that we will. We're often afraid that we will uh, make poor decisions, bad choices, our hearts will grow cold, we'll live wasted lives, and yet we know that when we stop looking at ourselves and said we look to Jesus and his faithfulness, and we try to be close to him, we know that you are a faithful shepherd who guides, blesses, and leads us. We've seen that, Lord, over the course of our lives. We've seen the way that you have moved circumstances and individuals into our lives, and you have used that, Lord, most especially you have, by your Spirit, guided us through your Word so that we have grown in our knowledge of you, in our trust of you, uh, Lord, in our commitment to you by your grace. And we're so grateful for that. And we acknowledge there's so many ways in, in which our hearts still need to be conformed more and more uh, so that we would follow you better, serve you better, trust in you more. But we praise you this morning because you're a God who faithfully keeps all of your promises. And you have promised that you will complete the work that you have begun in us. Lord, we desire by your grace to live wise lives. Uh, but when we acknowledge that, when we know that we have been called to that, Lord, then we know that we must also confess our sins in that. Lord, you want us to live in a way that's pleasing to you. We desire to do that. And yet we find, Lord, so often that we waste the time that you've entrusted to us. Father, as we look at the passage we're going to be studying this morning, we're going to be reminded of the fact that you want us to make the most of the time, but we uh, just foolishly kind of fritter time away. We live as though we will always have more time, as though we're always going to be here, as if time is given to us an endless supply. We're all caught up on the things of this world. We know about the latest sports events and news and television and the Hollywood gossip, but when we look back over the course of the last week even, we see, uh, Lord, just that because we were so focused on this world, we have not accomplished for you the things we would have liked to. Lord, we have not prioritized your word in the way we should and time with you in the way we should. We've not prioritized prayer in the way that we should. Uh, Father, instead, we've taken the time that you've entrusted to us and, and too much of the time we've used it for ourselves and our own purposes, and we confess that. And we ask, God, that you'd make us wise. We ask that you would help us to see how short our days are Lord, teach us to number our days that we would gain a heart of wisdom. And Father, help us to make the most of the time because the days are evil. Lord, we thank you this morning because by your grace you're guiding us. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you that when we ask you for wisdom, you never despise us, but you give to us freely. We thank you that when we need wisdom for a decision, Lord, you bring people into our lives to guide us and to help us. We thank you especially for the ministry of the church and other brothers and sisters who are able to speak into our lives and help us to think clearly about what will be most honoring to you. We thank you most of all for the Spirit of God who lives within us, who comforts and strengthens and guides us. And we thank you, God, that you're teaching us to prioritize eternity over time. Lord, we thank you that you're at work in us in that way to help us be a heavenly-minded people. Father, this world is darkness, and we're to, we're to shine as lights in the world. One of the ways that we'll do that is by being a people of heaven, a, a people who are thinking about eternity in the way that we live day by day. So do that good work in us and help us to prioritize your kingdom even more. Father, we don't pray just for ourselves this morning. We pray for all the nations of the world. Lord, you're a great king. You're the king of the Netherlands. We pray for this nation, 17 million people, mostly secular, mostly just kind of a wash and a 
a secularistic philosophy, worldview, materialism, where there's much immorality, just as there is in our own broken nation. There's much sexual immorality there. Father, a great Christian heritage in the Netherlands, but largely forgotten. And so we pray that in your mercy, by your spirit, you would move, Lord, among the people of the Netherlands. We pray that you would move in particular among your church. We think that your church is there. And we pray for faithful pastors who will shepherd their people well, uh, who will teach them the whole counsel of God boldly. Lord, we pray that you would build up the witness of our brothers and sisters, help them not to be seduced by this world, but instead help them also to be heavenly minded. And Lord, I pray that they would be a people who share your gospel. And we pray that we would see the church in the Netherlands revived and built up. God, we pray for our own nation as well this morning as we have um, remembered solemnly the events of 9-11 once again, almost 20 years ago. In those times, we saw more clearly than perhaps we do now how fleeting life is, how uncertain it is. And many are still grieving, and we pray for families that are still grieving the loss of that day. We pray that, that we would be mindful, Lord, of your sovereignty, and we would be prayerful. Lord, we ask for your mercy on our nation. We pray that in light also of the fires that are raging really across the West. Lord, we would ask that you would show mercy to us, not because we deserve mercy, but because you're merciful. We pray that you would spare life, uh, that you'd spare homes. And we pray, God, that you give wisdom to the leaders in those areas to know how to handle these fires. Lord, we pray for leaders in our own area. We pray this morning for the sheriff, David Harden, the sheriff of James City County. We pray that he and those that work under him would be protected by your sovereign hand. And we pray, God, that you'd help them to do their job well and with justice. And we pray, Lord, that there would be a a spirit of peace that is in our community uh, so that we would respect authorities that have been placed over us and so that they would exercise the authority that they've been entrusted with well and fairly. And we pray that you give David Harden great wisdom as he does that. We pray most especially for his relationship with you. Uh, If he does not know you, we pray that he would come to know you as Savior and King. And if he does, Lord, then we pray that he would grow in his relationship with you. Lord, we pray for other churches this morning. We thank you for Smith Memorial Baptist Church and the fact that they are proclaiming your gospel. We thank you for their pastor, Pastor John Chicka. We pray that you'd bless him and his family today. We pray that you'd build up the ministry of that church and the teaching ministry of that church and the the practical ministries that they do in the community. We're grateful for that. And we ask, Lord, more and more you would build Smith Memorial Church up, that they would more and more increasingly be a church that just radiates the love of Christ. We thank you that they do, and we pray that they would do that more and more. Father, we pray for our own church as well. We pray, God, that you'd make uh, us a church that has a culture of discipleship as we think now about how we can be involved in one another's lives through community groups and Bible studies, and one-on-one discipleship relationships. We pray that you'd help us to do that wisely, given the restraints that we have, but we pray that you'd help us do that. Father, remind us that eternity is long and this life is short, so help us to prioritize the time we have. And God, give us grace and wisdom to know how to be involved in one another's lives well in these unusual times. And we pray that you would build up a culture of discipleship in our church where it's just common, common for us to be meeting up with others to study your word and to encourage one another to be more like Jesus in this church. And Lord, we pray that our church would be marked by a godly wisdom. God, we need your wisdom in these days. Uh, Give the elders great wisdom as we think about all the different circumstances that we're facing as a church. Lord, we need a a, a facility that fits. And so, God, we pray for that. We pray that you would would grant us that, whether that's here or elsewhere. We pray that you would help us know uh, how we can accommodate uh, the numbers that you've given us. And we thank you for growth, but it's a responsibility. And, Lord, it's a need. And so we pray that you'd go before us and you would provide the way. Uh, that we would have a facility that fits our church. And Lord, we pray that you do that good work. Thank you now that you will come and help us as we study your word. And we pray that you would. Lord, guide us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take your copy of God's word and turn with me, if you will, to the book of Ephesians. And we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 5. Verses 15 to 21 this morning. So when you have that, please stand with me. And we're going to read this word. I will read it to you. You follow along, and we'll stand out of respect for God's word this morning. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. 
Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is God's word for us this morning. Please be seated. It's a great passage. It's a familiar passage. It's such a rich passage. There's so much here. Fortunately, we will not be able to say everything. Unfortunately, we'll not be able to say everything this morning. But as you look at it, you see that it's a passage that's focused on wisdom and us having wisdom so that we can walk in a way that's pleasing to God. So I thought about how to introduce the sermon this morning. I was reminded of a poem by C.T. Studd, and I've shared just a phrase of this poem in the past, but I want to just kind of remind you of it because I think it speaks well to the issue at hand this morning. Let me just read the opening kind of stanza with you of this poem that C.T. Studd wrote. He was a 19th century missionary to Africa and a faithful man. He said, two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life which will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And that last part of that poem is the, is the phrase that's repeated over and over as he reminds us, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. It's a poem that teaches us very important lessons. It reminds us that life is short, and it reminds us that the way we live matters and how we use the time that the Lord has entrusted to us that that matters as well. So those who live their lives for this world only, just kind of wasting away the minutes and the days of their lives, will one day be shown to be foolish. They'll have to stand before God, and they'll have to give an account for the way that they have lived their lives, and they will face judgment for wasting their lives. But those who live for God, which is to say those who make the best use of the times we're going to talk about in this passage, well, one day they're going to stand before God and they're going to be shown to be wise because God is going to reward them for all that they have done for Christ. And that's really one of the main emphases you see in our passage for study this morning, this need that we have to live well, to live for God, to invest our lives. This is a a passage that paints a beautiful picture of wisdom in living how we're supposed to live in a way that's pleasing to God. So I'm praying as we study this passage together this morning that God will use this passage and this time together to just kind of conform our hearts and our lives more to Christ because as we'll we'll remind ourselves this morning, Jesus is perfect wisdom. It's his pattern that we want to follow. So we're continuing our study of the book of Ephesians. We're in a portion of the book where Paul is is teaching these Ephesian believers uh, from this church near the city of Ephesus in the first century, but of course, teaching us as well because God's word is timeless, how it is that we're supposed to walk, how it is that we're supposed to live. He says there in verse one of this chapter that we are to walk as beloved children of God. And the idea again is that we are to bear the family image in all that we do. We're to live in a way that reminds people what God is like. So when we studied verses 2 to 6, we saw that the believers are supposed to walk in agape love, this self-giving, self-sacrificial love, and we're to avoid the world's counterfeit, and the world's counterfeit for love is lust. We're to avoid that. Last week, we looked at verses 7 to 14, and we saw that believers are to walk as light in the world. And we thought together about how Jesus is light. But because we, by faith, are united to Christ, we become light in Him. And so we are supposed to live that way. We're to live lives that are marked by goodness and righteousness and truth. And this morning, again, we're going to be looking at this issue of wisdom here. Paul teaches us that we should be walking in wisdom, and he lays that out for us. What does it look like to walk in wisdom? What does it look like to live a wise life? So we're going to study this passage using two points this morning. In verse 15, we're going to see the command to walk wisely. The command to walk wisely. And then verses 16 to 21, we're going to see three characteristics of a wise walk. What does it look like practically? Well, he lays it out for us very clearly. Let's look at that first point together this morning, the command to walk wisely. Verse 15, take your copy of God's Word and look there. You'll be helped if you follow along in your Bible this morning. Look carefully then how you walk not as unwise, but as wise. This is really kind of the main emphasis. This is the main command of this passage, that we would be a people who walk wisely. And again, the idea of walking there is that we would live well, that we would live in a way that's pleasing to God. 
And notice here that word carefully means that we're supposed to, we're supposed to pay attention to this. The word careful, it speaks of accuracy, of exactness. It really talks about examining something closely, carefully. And so believers are not supposed to live kind of a careless life. Uh, we're not supposed to live kind of a laissez-faire lifestyle, a cavalier lifestyle. Instead, we're supposed to be regularly and closely examining the way that we live, really day by day. How are we living in this day that God has given to us? And notice that we're not supposed to walk unwisely, but we're supposed to walk wisely. Well, what's the difference? You know, biblically speaking, what's the difference between being unwise and being wise? Well, speaking of unwise, the unwise person, according to the Bible, the unwise person is a person who does not acknowledge God in the way that he or she lives. So listen to Psalm 14, verse 1. It says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And so the, the fool is a person that actually lives his or her life without any kind of thought or care or concern about whether there is a God or not. It doesn't have to be an open atheist. It can just be a practical atheist that goes through his or her day without the thought of God. And because he or she does not acknowledge God, what inevitably happens is that this person will pursue sin. Living a lifestyle that's marked by sin. You see that in the second part of Psalm 14, verse 1, where the psalmist continues, they are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. So when we're talking about a, an unwise life, we're not talking most fundamentally about you know, poor decision-making or missing good opportunities. A person might be educated, might be wealthy, might be very, very successful. And yet, according to the Bible, if he or she lives their life in such a way that does not acknowledge God, doesn't kind of keep God before them as they live their lives, they're fools. They're foolish. They are living unwisely. And we may not see their folly in this life, but again, the judgment day is the day that's going to make everything so crystal clear. The folly of living life without God will become clear on that day when they must stand before God and explain why they took all that God had entrusted to them intellect, opportunities, breath, life, and instead of using it for him and his glory, decided to use it for themselves. It's a very solemn, serious thing to live a life that is unwise. But a wise person is different. A wise person is someone that keeps the thought of God before them. You know, as you kind of go through your day, I'm, I'm concerned, how's, how's God viewing this? Am I living in a way that brings a smile to his face? Not this craven fear of God at all times. That's not what it is to be a child of God. It's this delight and desire that, that what I'm doing right now would be significant, that what I'm doing would matter, that what I'm doing right now would be something that would be pleasing to my heavenly Father. And so as I go through the day, I should be thinking about that. And of course, it's not just today, it's every day. And again, this isn't a matter of kind of a worldly success or, you know, a person can be uneducated, a person could be unsuccessful in work, but it doesn't really matter because if this man or woman is walking with the thought of God before them, well, then this person in the eyes of God is wise and their wisdom will be seen, will be seen when they stand before God and they hear something like, well done, good and faithful servant. Let me make just one observation before we move on. Walking wisely, it requires careful attention. That's what Paul's saying here. Be careful, look carefully then how you walk. And the idea is that it requires us to pay attention to the way that we're living. Now, many believers, they just seem to kind of coast through life. You'll see this as you're in the church. They'll come to church on Sundays, but they're not really intentional about studying God's Word during the week. They're not particularly intentional about their prayer lives. They're not very intentional about using the spiritual gifts that God has entrusted to them to bless others. They're not intentional about helping other believers grow spiritually. They're not particularly intentional about sharing the gospel with the lost, they just kind of coast. Now, now they're saved, we trust they're saved, they're believing the gospel, there's some fruit in their lives, and yet, for the most part, if you were to look at their life, you would say, this doesn't strike me as wisdom. This doesn't seem to be careful. Such a person, they, they live their life, but they fail to live wisely, and because they fail to live wisely, they do not accomplish much for God. But verse 15 says it shouldn't be that way. Instead of being unwise, we're to be wise in the way that we live. We're to live in a way that pleases God. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense that it would require careful thought to live as a Christian. So think about what you have in your hand this morning. If you have this, you have the very Word of God, the God whose ways are higher than our ways and thoughts are higher than our thoughts. 
it makes sense that we should have to study it carefully. It makes sense that we should have to give our minds to it so that we understand what it is that he would teach us. Some things, the most important things in his grace, he's made so crystal clear. And yet there are these deep things that we can know and grow in our relationship with him. And we should study God's word carefully. Prayer is essential for spiritual strength. One of the reasons why people struggle with besetting sins over and over and over is because we're not praying and asking God to help us. We're trying to live the Christian life in our own power, and so we fail. Instead, we should be intentional about making time for prayer each day. The church is precious to God. It's what God's doing in the world. What is God doing in the world? He's building His church. That's what Jesus is doing. He's building His church. And so we should be intentional about investing our lives in what God's doing. We should be investing our lives in the people of God. The lost are in extreme spiritual danger. That's so easy to forget, isn't it? So we live our lives, we just, we don't think about the fact that our neighbor, family member, co-worker, that this person is an immortal soul that must one day stand before God and give an account for the way he or she have lived. Well, so we should be intentional about building relationships with them so that we can love them. And the most loving thing we can do is talk with them about Jesus. That's loving. And then Satan is crafty. And so we shouldn't let him lull us to sleep. We shouldn't let him deceive us or distract us from following God. Instead, we should be vigilant, watching, and praying. In short, the Christian life is serious, so we can't coast. We have to live intentionally. I, I like what John Stott said about this. He said, everything worth doing requires care. We all take trouble over the things which seem to us to matter, our job, our education, our home and family, our hobbies, our dress and appearance. So as Christians, we must take trouble over the Christian life. We must treat it as the serious thing that it is. And I think that's a very helpful reminder for us. Well, looking at verse 15, we see this command to walk wisely. Look, look now at verses 16 to 21. We see here three characteristics, or this is the second point if you're taking notes, three characteristics of a wise walk. Again, there's so much in this passage, we're not going to be able to unpack everything, but hopefully I'm going to be giving us some, some major pegs, and so maybe you'll be able to come back this week and study this passage more deeply and go, go further into it. Looking at this passage as a whole, looking at these verses, verse 16 to 21 as a whole, you see that Paul gives us three descriptions of a wise life, three descriptions of a wise life, three characteristics. And what is it like? Well, it's a life that makes best use of the time. And it's a life that understands and pursues God's will. And it's a life that's under the control of the Holy Spirit. We're going to look at each one of those. So let's look at those uh, one at a time. This first characteristic, a wise life makes the best use of the time. Look at verse 16. That's what Paul says there very clearly. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Now think about time. Time is a precious commodity. Time goes by at the same rate for all of us. You know, 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day, 365 days a year passes by at the same rate for all of us. And yet once it passes by, we can never get it back. It's gone. So it doesn't matter. If you have all the, all the money in the world, you cannot buy back one second of time once it's passed. More seriously, we'll all one day give an account for the way we have stewarded the time that God has entrusted to us. So Paul says, and we should make the most of it, right? That's what Paul encourages these believers to do. Make the most of the time that God has entrusted to us. That phrase there, making the best use of the time, it can also be translated to buy back the time. It's the idea, purchase it back, buy it back, make it significant. The idea is that time is precious, and that's what a wise Christian does. He or she takes the time that the Lord has entrusted to him or her, well, and they use it well. And in verse 16, the second part, Paul reminds us that we should use time well because the days are evil. What does it mean that the days are evil? It means that Satan is the God of this world. If you want to know why the entire course of this world runs contrary to God and all the philosophies that flow out of all the universities and trickle down into social media and the movies and everything else seem to take you away from God, it's because there's an organizing principle behind it. And so the world and the world system is not pro-God, pro-truth, pro-Christ. It's just the opposite, and that means that we are on enemy ground as we live our lives. And Satan has plenty of opportunity to kind of distract us. And to tempt us to live for this life, to tempt us to live for the here and now, but as believers, we must not do that. Instead, we should be mindful that there's spiritual danger. 
And so we should be careful how we spend the time the Lord has entrusted to us so that our lives would bring glory to him. Jonathan Edwards grasped this. He was a theologian of the 18th century. At the age of 19, so like some of our college students, he wrote this resolution, resolved, never to lose one moment of time, but to improve it in the most profitable way I possibly can. And that's the spirit of what Paul's saying here in this verse. Make the most of the time. Buy back the time. That's a good resolution. That's a resolution that all of us should follow. But let me give a particular word to young people here. So high school students, college students, just kind of listen for a minute as I speak to you about this. You are at the beginning of your adult lives. Strong, uh, healthy. You feel like you're never going to die. I vaguely remember what that was like. And, And Satan likes to use that. He makes you think you have all the time in the world. So he'll say things like, hey, you know what? You can get serious about serving God later. Now's the time to relax. Now's the time to have fun. Now's the time to enjoy this. And hey, you can start serving God when you're in your 30s. If you've heard a thought like that before, it's because Satan doesn't have any new tricks. He's been using it in every generation from the very beginning. Here's the problem. Satan lies. Satan lies. You see, friends, you're not only going to give an account for your 30s and your 40s and your 50s. You're going to give an account for right now. You're going to give an account for your youth as well and the way that you've invested the time that the Lord has entrusted to you right now in your youth. And you must remember this as well, that you're just like the rest of us. And none of us really know if we're going to make our next birthday or not, do we? None of us know the hour of our death. None of us know when that's going to happen. And so wisdom says... Make the best use of the time. Live for the Lord now. Live for God today and each day until you see him face to face. The author of Ecclesiastes gave good advice when he said, Remember also the Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. So that's his first characteristic then, making the best use of the time. That's what a wise life looks like. In verse 17, there's a second characteristic. So look at that, verse 17. Here we see that a wise life understands and pursues God's will. Paul continues, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, verse 17 flows out of what we've just been saying about the the evilness of the time, the need that we have to make the best use of the time that the Lord has entrusted to us. And if we're going to do that, we can't be foolish. That word foolish there, it speaks of being senseless. It speaks of lacking understanding. But instead, we must understand what the will of God is. We should be intentional in searching that out, trying to understand what God's will is and all that we do as we live our lives. Now, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? It makes perfect sense that if you want to live wisely, you want to live in a way that pleases God, you should want to know what God's will is. But a lot of believers struggle at this point. They want to serve God, they want to follow His will, but they don't know what that is. They can't seem to figure out what His plan for them is. You know, they say things like, you know, if they're single, they say, is it God's will that I be married? Or should I marry this person? Or or shouldn't I marry this person? What is God's will? If they're married, they say, does God want us to have children now or should we wait? They have kids. They say, well, how does God want us to educate our children? You know, should we do homeschool? Should we do public school? Should we do Christian school? We need wisdom. Others ask, does God want me to continue doing this job? Or does God want me to pursue this other opportunity? Does God want me to go to this other city and, you know, serve Him there? I don't know. What's wisdom? Older saints ask, does God want me to retire? Or should I keep working? You see, this is a question we keep asking all throughout our lives, wondering what is the will of God for me And it can be very easy to get frustrated because you feel like you can't know it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So what should we do? Those are are good questions. Okay, here's the problem with all of those questions is that the Bible doesn't give us answers to all of those particular kinds of questions. Right? The Bible doesn't tell you whether or not you should move to this city. It doesn't tell you whether or not you should marry this person. It doesn't tell you whether or not you should retire. So what help can we give? for those that are seeking to understand God's will. Well, we we don't have time to say everything this morning, but it's very helpful to understand that throughout church history, theologians have kind of talked about the will of God in two ways. They've spoken of it as the revealed will of God, and they've spoken of it as the secret will of God. 
So the revealed will of God includes all the commands of Scripture. So do not lie, do not steal, do not commit adultery, love your neighbor as yourself, make disciples. All of those are the revealed will of God. That's God's will for us, that we would walk in obedience to His Word. And that part, praise God, and listen, the most important part is perfectly clear. He's laid out for us what His will is, that we would be holy as Christ is holy, that we would pursue Him with joy in our hearts, that we'd walk in obedience to our God. So if we choose to disobey one of the commands that God has given us in His Word, we can be sure that in that moment we are not walking in God's will. But if we are, by His grace, walking in obedience to His revealed will in His Word, well, we know that we're bringing glory to Him in that way. God's secret will, on the other hand, is God's personal plan for each of our lives. And here's the thing about God's secret will. It's a secret. And so it's hard to know. Hard to know what exactly God wants me to do in this situation. We only learn God's secret will for our lives as we live our lives. As we walk with God day by day, really as He leads us by the hand day by day, we come to know His will for our lives. Now, this frustrates many believers because, well, we want to know all of God's secret will. We want to know God's plan, or at least we want to know the next five years of God's plan. But God doesn't work that way. God leads us by faith and not by sight. God, again, wants us to walk with Him day by day and trust Him. God wants us to trust Him to make our way straight as we trust in Him. But that doesn't mean that we're not supposed to try to discern His will. That's what Paul says here in verse 17, right? Doesn't Paul say that? Understand what the will of the Lord is? That includes both the revealed will of God and also the secret will of God. Now, we've talked about the revealed will. That's very clear. We've got to do that. What's this secret will? Well, let's think about how can we know God's secret will? How can we discover it? Let me give you just a few steps that I found helpful as I've thought about decision-making and living according to God's will in my own life, okay? First, make sure you're walking in God's revealed will. Okay, that's the first step. Make sure that you are obeying God in all the ways that have been laid out for you to do. So if some decision comes along and that decision would lead you to disobey a clear command of Scripture, it doesn't matter if Satan gives you five reasons why you should do it. You shouldn't do it. Instead, you should trust God and you should walk in accordance to His commands. And if you do that, you're keeping the most important aspect of walking in the will of God. But what about when you come to a particular decision that needs to be made? What about the secret will of God for your life? How should you process these kind of decisions? Well, let me give you just some thoughts, some things that I think are biblical and helpful. First, start with prayer. James chapter 1, verse 5 says, If you lack wisdom, ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and he'll give it to you. So if you need wisdom for a particular decision, you go to God first and you ask him to give you wisdom and you rejoice in the fact that he will. Then get wise counsel from spiritually mature uh, men or women who can help you process the decision that you need to make. Praise God that we have a church, that we don't have to make all of these decisions by ourselves, that I can talk with someone who's a little further along in the faith or in this aspect of their life and I can say, hey, what do you think? I need wisdom. And then ask that person, think with that person about this most especially, What is going to be the most helpful thing for my spiritual life and for helping other people as they follow Jesus? So just for example, you might have an opportunity to take a great job in some faraway city. It all looks great on paper, but there's a problem. There's no healthy local church there. What should you do? Well, now you have to think about it. Because what if if God's doing in this world, if what he's doing in this world is building the church, well, it's very important for you to be a part of a healthy local church where you can grow and help other people grow. And so you need to process and think with a godly, mature brother or sister about what's the wisest decision to make in that situation. Then after you get counsel, you should ask what you want to do, what you want to do. Remember, if you've dealt with the revealed will of God and you know that you're walking in obedience to His commands, in a sense, it doesn't matter which decision you make. You can go to the city or you can stay here. You know, God's plans for you are not going to be destroyed by that decision. You can do what you would like to do. Why? Because God is so kind that he often guides us by the desires he gives us. 
Uh, it's what Proverbs, excuse me, what Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. It doesn't mean he'll give you a Ferrari. It means he will conform your heart to be like his heart so that you'll want to do the thing that he wants you to do. And then after you've sought God's wisdom, after you've sought godly counsel, after you've asked what it is that you want to do, then make a decision. Don't be stuck in paralysis. Don't be stuck in fear. Boldly make the decision. Simply do what you think is best. And then, thank God. Thank God for helping you make the decision. And trust Him. Don't beat yourself up over and over. Did I make the right decision? Was this the right decision? I don't know if this is the right decision. You see, our God is so big and so sovereign that He is able to help us. Listen, as we go through our lives, we'll make bad decisions. We will intentionally want to make good decisions, and we'll make bad decisions. But God never puts us on a plan B for our lives. Now, he's so sovereign, right? This one that he guides the courses of the stars and the galaxy, well, he guides the course of our life as well. And he's able to kind of turn things the way he wants them to turn. And so we can rest, and we can trust him, and we can make decisions, and we can leave the outcome to him. It's a good thing. Yeah, if we want to understand the will of God, we start with God's word. And then we seek him for godly wisdom. And that's what a wise life looks like. That's that second characteristic. Now look at the third characteristic from verses 18 to 21. A wise life is under the control of the Holy Spirit. A wise life is under the control of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Do you notice again that Paul gives a negative command and then he gives a positive command? Be looking for that as you as you read the Bible, study the Bible on your own, because he often teaches us both from a negative and then also from the positive. The negative command is do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. So it's not sinful for a believer to enjoy alcohol responsibly. That's not sinful. It is sinful to get drunk. It is sinful to get drunk. Right? The word, uh, Paul goes so far to say that drunkenness is debauchery. That word debauchery speaks of recklessness, of wild living. I found this interesting this week that Jesus actually uses a form of this word that's pronounced debauchery there to describe the lifestyle of the prodigal son when he was in the far country. Wild living, reckless living. And that's the point Paul's making. Those who are under the control of alcohol are out of control of themselves. And that leads them to make all kinds of sinful decisions. And Christians are never to be so under the influence of alcohol that they lose control of themselves. Instead, look at the second part of verse 18 now. Here's the positive command, be filled with the Spirit. Now, what does that mean? Be filled with the Spirit. I'm going to teach you what it means this morning, but I intend no disrespect for those that might disagree in some way. Some charismatic teachers say being filled with the Spirit is something that happens after a person is saved. They're kind of walking along in their Christian life and they become aware of the Spirit in a new way and all of a sudden they are filled with this influence of the Spirit and they have something of a second experience of grace and usually what they term as the filling of the Spirit is accompanied by speaking in tongues and other kinds of ecstatic experiences. And I am not casting judgment on anyone who has had that kind of experience, but I am saying that that's not what the Bible means when it talks about being filled with the Spirit. So what does it mean? You know, the Bible teaches that at the moment of salvation, every believer receives the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So we saw that when we studied Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14. Paul called that the sealing of the Spirit. And the idea is that God kind of puts His mark on us by giving us His Spirit that lives within us. And the Spirit of God, praise God, never leaves us. And so we always have the Spirit of God But the filling of the Spirit is not the same as the sealing of the Spirit. And I found MacArthur helpful here. As he talked about this word filled, he said it has a few shades of meaning. So it can mean to fill something up, like the way that the wind would fill up a sail. It can mean that kind of filling there. Or it can speak of permeation, you know, the way kind of yeast will permeate its way through a lump of dough so that the dough is kind of fully permeated with the yeast. And it can speak of control. So think about a person who's in a rage, a person who's filled with anger. What happens? That person falls under the control of the anger and acts accordingly. I think that last metaphor is the one that Paul had uppermost in his mind 
when he talked about being filled with the Spirit. So think about that first command. The negative command was, do not be drunk with wine. The idea is, do not be under the control of alcohol. That's the idea. But instead, be filled with the Spirit. In other words, be under the full control of the Holy Spirit. And notice that this isn't an option. I'm sure I've had this thought before at some point, but it struck me afresh this week. I'm sure I've heard this at some point. Do you notice it's not an option? Being filled with the Spirit is not an option for the believer. It's a command. So it should be something that we should be consciously thinking about. Am I being filled with the Spirit right now? Right? Am I living in this way that I've been commanded to by the Bible? It requires active obedience. And then notice that the filling isn't a one-time event. So it's not a one-time second experience of grace. Actually, the command is in the present tense in the Greek, which means it's continual, it's ongoing. This is something that is to mark and characterize our lives. So every minute of every day, we are to be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, who isn't convicted by that? Just right now, we just need to stop and we need to confess our sin Because it's so easy to be distracted from this, right? It's so easy to start living in my own strength, trying to do the Christian life in my own power, not to be thinking about how desperately I need the Holy Spirit to help me do anything, anything that's spiritually worthwhile. But that is the supremely lofty command we have been given. Every minute of every day, we are to seek the filling of the Holy Spirit as we seek to live for God. And at this point, we should praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about the fact that this is how he lived his life. His entire life, he's filled with the Spirit. Supremely so in his ministry, you see Jesus filled with the Spirit go on and do the next act of ministry. Every moment of every day, the fullness of the Spirit overflows in his life. And from that power comes the teaching and the miracles and the obedience And praise Jesus for this reason. While we fail to be filled with the Spirit, we are counted righteous in Him. And His life is given to us. His perfect obedience in this way is given to us as well. The wise life is a life that is continually being filled with the Spirit, which is to say it is a life that is under the control of the Spirit of God every moment. It's a beautiful life. What does it practically look like? I think it's a question we all want to have. So how do we do this? If this is a command, how, how do we do this, right? How, how is it that we're supposed to be being filled with the Spirit? Let me read two passages, and I'm going to ask you to turn with me in just a second. Not just yet. First, stay where you are in Ephesians chapter 5. I want to read two passages, and I want you to listen carefully to the way Paul speaks, and I think he gets to the heart of this issue of what it means to be filled with the Spirit. So look again at verse 18, and we're going to read from 18 to 20. Paul says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now turn in your Bible to Colossians chapter 3, General Electric Power Company. So Colossians is two books over, kind of towards the back of the Bible. Colossians chapter 3. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, General Electric Power Company. That's helpful. Or Gentiles eat pork chops. That's another one you can do. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Kind of look up at me when you have it. All right, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. These letters were written at almost the same time. They're both prison epistles. And you see how the the thoughts, you see the similarity between these two things. In Ephesians 5, Paul commands us to be filled with the Spirit. And then he describes the overflow of that. What does it look like? What effect does it have? Well, there's addressing one another and singing and thanksgiving. And then you go to Colossians 3, and Paul commands the Colossian believers and us, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And then he describes the effects. And what are the effects? Teaching, singing, and thanksgiving. Do you hear the similarity? Well, it is to say this. From this, we learn that being filled with the Holy Spirit is virtually the same as letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly. 
the way to be filled with the Spirit is to let God's Word dwell richly in your life. It's to be intentional about this. It's to study. It's to read. It's to meditate on the truth of God's Word, asking the Spirit to fill us and knowing that as we do so, the Spirit will fill us with the truth of God's Word and will help us. He will conform us to Christ so that we live under the control of the Holy Spirit. If you want to be Spirit-filled, be filled with God's Word and ask the Spirit to control your life. And He will more and more. What is the effect of being filled with the Spirit? I'll go back to Ephesians chapter 5. What effect should we see from being filled with the Holy Spirit? Verses 19 to 21, Paul lists these four effects of being filled with the Spirit. First, those who are filled with the Spirit enjoy deep fellowship as they worship together. First part of verse 19, Paul says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. What's the overflow of being filled with the Spirit in the life of the believer? Well, particularly as we gather together, it's worshiping together. It is encouraging and admonishing one another together as we do that. We are commanded to sing praise to one another. What a good thing of God to command us to do what's good for us. That's why as a church, we're not particularly interested in having a huge band. We don't really want loud music. We want to hear your voices sing. That's harder, isn't it? Because there's less of us in the room. Well, we trust that our brothers and sisters outside whom we love, that they're singing. And we need to be singing out here as well because this is part of what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit. Second, those who are filled with the Spirit worship the Lord from the heart. Look at the second part of verse 19. Paul says, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. And the idea is that there's going to be an overflow of praise, but intentionally, purposely a praise to God. And that's not going to be an outward and formal thing. That's going to be a heartfelt, genuine, sincere thing. And then in verse 20, those who are filled with the Spirit are marked by thankfulness to God. This is a a lofty picture here. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, always and for everything. That's difficult, isn't it? But what about hard things? We don't give thanks for trials in and of themselves. We're never commanded to do that. But we give thanks to our Heavenly Father because He's so good that He takes everything, even the hard things, and He uses them to make us like Jesus. He uses them to guide us down this good path that He has for us, and we don't see how good it is yet. But when we get to heaven and see him face to face, we're going to see just how good it is, just how good he is. And so we thank him because this is the will of God for us in Christ Jesus. Fourth, those who are filled with the Spirit are marked by a humble submission towards one another. That's what verse 21 says. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. In other words, those who are filled with the Spirit do not demand their own way. So every commercial that says, Have it your way, do it your own way, be your own special person, make everyone else do what you want them to do. Friend, you have to understand, none of that is spirit-filled. No, the spirit-filled life is a life that looks humble and submissive. It's not concerned about self, it's not concerned about me and what I want. No, instead, the the spirit-filled person keeps in mind the example of Jesus. That's what this reverence for Christ speaks of at the end, out of reverence for Christ It keeps in mind the example of Jesus, and it walks like Jesus in humbly submitting and serving others, even to the point of death. So these are the effects of being filled with the Spirit. There's this overflow of fellowship and praise and thanksgiving and humility, this humble submission. And that's what a wise life looks like. So think about what we see in verses 16 to 21. These three characteristics. It's a life that makes the best use of time. It's a life that understands and pursues God's will. It's a life that is under the control of the Holy Spirit. That's what a wise life looks like. And my question from this is, friend, are you living that kind of life? Is that the kind of life you're living? So are you making the most of the time? Uh, In other words, are you living for eternity? Or are you trying to make yourself as happy as you can in this quickly dying world? Are you seeking to understand God's will? Are you pursuing God's will? Are you living for your own will? Do you possess the Holy Spirit of God? It's just break all the people of the world into two groups, those who have God within and those who don't. Friend, do you possess the Spirit of God? 
And are you seeking to walk under his control? Or is something else controlling your life? Friends, the Bible is very clear that God wants us to walk in wisdom. So how, if you don't have this, how can you begin to walk this way? Well, you begin to walk in wisdom when you submit your life to Jesus, who's perfect wisdom. And you see, that brings us to the gospel, this good news that there's a God who loves you, friend, and created you, who, who made you because he wants a relationship with you. And that relationship would be marked by love and obedience and fellowship. But all of us have rebelled against this God. Uh, we were born sinful, and because we were born sinful, it felt so natural for us to just kind of want to go our own way. And we thought that thinking our own way would make us happy, and we thought that pursuing our own desires would make us happy, and so we were just kind of walking along, pursuing self and interest in what I want to do with my life, very unconcerned about God and living for Him. And that led us to sin against God. It led us to harm others as well. All of us have broken the commands that we've been given in this Word, and the Bible tells us that sin is serious. The Bible tells us that sin separates us from God so that if we were to die still in our sins and stand before this holy and perfect and majestic God, we would face his judgment and we would be separated from him forever and ever. And friend, that's the very best human wisdom can do. That's where human wisdom leads us. There's a higher wisdom and the higher wisdom is the gospel. It's God's plan of salvation that God the Father uh, he so loved this world, the men and women of this world, that he sent his son Jesus into this world. Jesus is the eternal son of God. He is the wisdom of God. And he lived a perfectly wise life. He always obeyed the will of his heavenly father. He always loved his neighbor as himself. And he came intentionally to die for sinners. And he did. When the time was right, he laid down his life on the cross, bearing in himself the wrath of God against the sins of all who will turn from their sins and trust in him. He died under the wrath of God but then he rose again. Why did he rise? It was because the Father had accepted his perfect sacrifice. Praise God. This is the wisdom of God, that we cannot live this kind of life. There's no way for you to be good enough for God, just as there's no way for me to be good enough for God. You don't have to be good enough for God because Jesus is. And you, if you will turn from your sins and put your hope in Jesus, even this morning, even right now, God will forgive you for all of your sins. He will welcome you into his family, and you will begin this journey of walking with him in wisdom. And Jesus, you will discover as you grow, well, he will be your wisdom, following his perfect example, he guiding you by his spirit. Friend, if you want to do that, the invitation for you this morning is to cry out for mercy. Put your hope in Christ. If you want to talk with someone, you can talk with me after the service this morning or someone around you. We'd love to talk with you about what Jesus has done for us. Friend, that's how you begin walking in wisdom is by putting your trust in Jesus and in Jesus alone. Well, we learned a lot about what it means to walk in wisdom from these verses. We've seen that it's to make the best use of time. It's to understand and pursue God's will. And it's to live under the control of the Holy Spirit, which is again to say... The wise life is a life that looks like Christ's life. And may God help us live that way in this coming week. And let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you because you have become all to us. You are righteousness, our peace, our redemption, and our wisdom this morning. We praise you for your perfect life that was lived for us so that we could, by uh, grace alone, through faith alone, enter into the fullness of blessing that is ours in Christ. And I pray for those who are here this morning who do not know you. I pray today that you would grant them wisdom to see themselves as those who have sinned against you and those who desperately need your salvation. And I pray that you give spiritual life this morning. And I pray for all of us who are, who are seeking to walk wisely. Lord, we see so many ways that we're not. And the enemy discourages us. But God, lift our eyes up to Christ. Help us to remember that we are perfect in him and help us again to just stand up and take the next step of obedience with joy because Christ died so that we might be both holy and happy. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as we conclude this morning, let's say our benediction together. Let's stand together. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated. The day is going to come when we're going to sing in response to God's word.